Thanks, Dr. Reed. Um, so oxygen concentrators have been uh, gaining some more attention in the news recently. Um, so originally uh, last year, everyone was very interested in uh, ventilators, especially um, ICU style ventilators, which are sort of at the um, critical care end of um, COVID. So what we're seeing now is the big need for oxygen and particularly in places like India. Um, and one of the advantages is that you don't really need um, high end clinical support and the drugs and um, staff and everything that comes with that. So um, the oxygen concentrators are quite a vital tool um, to treat even at home for um, the majority of COVID cases. So um, they're quite a difficult device to build, quite temperamental. And um, we've got some experts and some engineers that have uh, had, a, had a go at at building various devices and we're sort of continuing to make progress on that. So I'd like to introduce Neil Downey. Are you here at the moment, Neil? Uh, yeah, I'm here, yeah. Hi, so yeah, Neil and Diane Downey. So Neil's the author of Industrial Gases and um, Diane's the leader of ExoVent, which is a negative pressure, um, like an iron lung type ventilator. Okay, can we share our screen? Okay. Yeah, can everybody see that and can everybody hear us? Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, uh, I'm Neil A. Downey um, and we're gonna talk about the challenges of oxygen concentrators using them as well as making them. Bam. Hi, I'm Di. We've only five minutes and you'll find a lot more detail in the notes that come with these slides. Oxygen, and, and I'm a, as, as well as being a founder member of Exavent, I'm also a, a doctor um, of medicine. We have only five minutes, um, so you look in the notes for the details. Oxygen's a drug and should be prescribed by indicating the target oxygen saturation for that patient usually 94 to 98%. Oxygen saturations are measured using an oximeter, that's a SATS meter, usually on the finger. They're pretty accurate, but you need to understand their strengths and weaknesses. Oximeters only measure how much oxygen is being carried by the hemoglobin in the red cells in the blood. They do not measure the tissue saturation of oxygen. So anemic patients can have normal SATS readings, but low tissue oxygen supplies levels. We all know that if your oxygen supply is stopped, you rapidly lose consciousness. Brain cells are rapidly susceptible to lack of oxygen, but all cells need oxygen and are damaged sooner or later when oxygen levels are too low for too long. And that's what you see in people dying at home from uh, COVID when they're not aware that their, uh, their tissue levels of oxygen are low. High levels of oxygen are also toxic. An oximeter will show 100% whether you have a normal amount of oxygen in the tissues or if you are dangerously supersaturated. And that's something that people should bear in mind when they're making oxygen concentration devices. Levels of oxygen that would be beneficial to a normal person with pneumonia can be dangerous for those with some underlying conditions where the level of CO2 in the blood is constantly too high. The respiratory control system in the brainstem, which takes, oops, which takes in, which is on here, there's a diagram of it here, um, which takes in data from various sensors in the body, resets to abnormal settings. These patients setting a target SATs of 94 to 98% can result a worsening of their condition as CO2 levels in the blood rise dangerously. So my challenge is how will you know how much oxygen you're supplying? Next flow rates. Now listen carefully, because this is something that's, um, well, I'm, I'm a GP by training, not in these systems, the stuff I have learned doing X event. Air flows into the lungs during inspiration and the inspiration part of the breathing cycle can be very short. For example, when a patient is breathing very fast because they are exercising or unwell. Over a minute at rest, the normal human will breathe in about five to eight liters of air. Moderate exercise increases this tenfold. Peak expiratory flow rates can temporarily be as much as hundreds of liters a minute. Sick people need more oxygen, hence the use of greater than normal oxygen levels in the inspired air and greater than normal flow rates to ensure that there's always enough air oxygen mixed there to be sucked in. 
Normal air contains 21% oxygen. Oxygen is added to air to achieve the higher inspired oxygen concentrations, up to uh, usually from 24% up to 100%. Usually you don't get anywhere near 100% because of the supersaturation oxygen toxicity problems. Normal people breathe in 21% oxygen and breathe out 16% oxygen. People on oxygen enriched air breathe out even more oxygen. That's a lot of oxygen going to waste. The challenge is to ensure that the right amount of oxygen is available when it's needed and to recycle it if you can. So oxygen concentrators. Um, just a reminder, uh, the atmosphere contains 1% argon alongside the oxygen. And that means that you've got, if you take out the nitrogen, you've got 95% oxygen and 5% argon in the mixture coming out of a concentrator. So 95% is the highest oxygen percentage you can do with an oxygen concentrator. Secondly, in a lot of places, a lot of the time, the atmosphere is 5% water vapor and that'll come back and bite us. And we're gonna talk about that in another slide. So how does an oxygen, how does an oxygen concentrator do its stuff? Uh, the compressor pumps in 100 liters a minute of air but only five litres a minute of oxygen comes out. The rest of the oxygen is thrown away in the exhaust. That means there's lots of room for improvement. Now you can do some quite complex things, but actually, once you've got an oxygen concentrator working, just opening the outlet valve wider could be a, a good thing to do. And this is what I got when I used a commercial um, uh, oxygen concentrator and modified it very slightly to take more flow. The top graph shows that as you draw more gas from the outlet, you get a lower percentage of oxygen. But up to a point, you get a higher mass of oxygen per unit time. In my test concentrator, I got near to the maximum mass of oxygen per unit time, eight liters a minute flow and 76% oxygen. Now, most patients don't need 90% or more oxygen. So that means you could supply two adult patients or maybe four or five children from a single concentrator. Just a word on pressure and storage. Oxygen uh, coming from a concentrator is at low pressure, sometimes as low as 300 millibar, a third of an atmosphere, and even in specially designed higher, compression, uh, higher pressure concentrators, not much more. But most ventilators need three bar or more to operate. Uh, now you can add a compressor, but you've got to be careful with oxygen, especially oxygen compressors or any gas which contains more than 23% oxygen. So a slight enrichment of oxygen can create a fire hazard. Storaging, storing oxygen is also useful against power cuts and against peaks in need. And if you've got pressurized oxygen, you can have a buffer vessel. But if you've got low pressure oxygen, as you have from a concentrator, you've got to do something else. And that needs some thinking about. Uh, and if you've only got a solar panel providing power for your concentrator, then you need to think about 16 hours or more of storage. So other considerations with concentrators, things that I've come across. Moisture is a big problem. It's 5% of the atmosphere. It's a big equipment killer causing rust. Um, but with oxygen concentrators, moisture gives another problem, the killing of the zeolite. And you can only unkill zeolite by removing the beds and heating up to, well, depends on the zeolite, but at least 200 Celsius. 200 Celsius is very hot, plus in a flow of dry gas. And finally, dust. There is dust everywhere, and there's dust in a lot of the places that concentrators are used. And it will block up your filters, and it'll do damage to other things. You've got to live with it. We've got to live with high humidity and temperature. We've got to live with dust and rust. Uh, back to the clinical breathing. The pressure in the lungs in normal breathing is never above atmospheric. Negative pressure ventilators, uh, known as iron lungs, which replicate natural breathing, became mass market devices in the 1920s when they were used successfully for patients with polio, as you can see in the upper slide. In the 19 50s, lighter, easier to manage positive pressure ventilators became mass market and iron lungs fell out of favour. Exavent, which is in the lower picture, 
is a lightweight torso only enclosure which ventilates the patient by reducing the pressure inside the patient enclosure a negative pressure system. The patient can eat, speak and drink whilst being ventilated. The patient can be given oxygen by face, face mask. A robust, robust and effective oxygen concentrator, concentrator is the perfect partner for an ex event in many settings, hence our interest in today's conference, because we hope to send our, in fact, we have ex event type devices being built by a team in Bangladesh and teams in India at the moment, and they, as we all know, desperately need oxygen to go with them. And that's us, and that's me in an ex event a year ago, almost exactly. And it was very comfortable. It was very comfortable. <laughs> We're finished. That's great, thank you. Um, so if anyone has any questions, um, do you, I don't think we have any questions right now. Yeah, if we could get the slides, um, I'm sure we'll get those and post those. Yeah. I just yeah. Added, added one question to the chat. Uh, thanks, Neil, and, and thank you both for that presentation, Dan, as well. But the uh, the data you talked about, the seven concentrators that were tested and only one producing good results, was that the David Peel study you're referencing, or is there some new data on that or new testing? Uh, that, that is the study you just referenced.